I'm sure you've heard the saying, you've maybe even said it, that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But that's not exactly true. As long as things don't have mass, they can go faster than the speed of light. A shadow can move faster than the speed of light. Things can appear to move faster than the speed of light. You can outrun light that's moving through rubidium gas. So things get complicated when you think about the speed of light. And so my guest today is Dr. Robert Nemiroff. He is a professor. He is, he is one of the minds behind the astronomy picture of the day. So if you've ever gone to APOD, uh, sort of half of the, the team that is choosing images and writing the descriptions is my guest today. Uh, I've been friends with Bob for a long time, and so we talk about sort of his work with APOD, we talk about his new book, Faster Than Light, sort of all the interesting ways that things can move faster than the speed of light. And then we talk about just like how maybe science itself can be improved, how people could get could publish ideas that are sort of against the mainstream, a little out there, and yet still get some publicity for their work. So uh, I hope you enjoy sort of every part of this interview with Robert Nemroff. Bob, it's good to see you again. Hey, it's good to see you. Long uh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we, we've hung out, I think, a couple of times now at various astronomical society meetings Absolutely. and have, like, thought about cool ideas for projects that we might work on at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll talk about that at a certain point. Maybe people mm -hmm. will be so excited by the ideas that they'll, they'll be encouraged to, to, uh, to nag us to keep doing this. But you are best known for your involvement with Astronomy Picture of the Day, which you have been doing for ever? Almost ever. 28 years. Close 28 to, years. Close to, close to infinity. Like that's the beginning of computers, right? Almost. Almost. <laughs> it's, uh, so the, the World Wide Web. Very old. Like so you were like the, the first website on the World Wide Web was Astronomy Picture of the Day. Well, we wanted uh, well, we had first 14 views our first day, but the first, when we first started uh, APOD, as I call it, or many people call it, um, so uh, we just um, we didn't know where it would go. Uh, we just thought it would be fun. We were, in a sense, we're doing a service of showing the coolest images because a lot of the images that were going around were just not being described well. They were email attachments, right? And so people were saying, this is some nebula somewhere, right? And so we were thinking, oh my God, it's some nebula somewhere. We can do better than that, right? Because we were, my, my office mate, Jerry Bennell and I, uh, were astronomers working on, you know, research in, in astronomy and astrophysics. And so we thought, well, we can do better than that. And so the, we just started you know, posting images. And, uh, and I said, the first day we got 14. And uh, we asked NASA headquarters, uh, by the way, I'm not speaking as a, um, as a representative of NASA just now, I'm myself only representing my only point of view. So uh, we asked uh, people in NASA in the upper higher ups at NASA Goddard, um, that's, that's what uh, if this was okay, and they said, well, you know what, the World Wide Web is really for scientists. So we're just not going to get involved. So, so they thought. So they didn't say okay. you couldn't do it. They weren't, but <laughs> they didn't say it would help. Yeah. So they just like you scientists, you go off and you use your World Wide Web, which is a science communication tool for whatever ways you want to communicate science with each other. And at that point, back in 1995, they just weren't convinced that the World Wide Web would be a way to communicate science outside of just between scientists. And so now when I mention this to them, there's like this silence, like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a hoot. Um, but yeah, so. like APOD mm. is a mainstay of everything that is mentioned on the Internet, that every, Wouldn't go that far. you know, yeah, I mean, like people share pictures all the time. You see it everywhere. And right. like give us a sense of like. How many people are, are coming and seeing these pictures every day? Well, you reminded me of another story that we didn't want the web, people were adding email attachments and they were getting it wrong. So we didn't want the web to be a stupid place where misinformation would rule back in 1995. We thought, well, maybe if we take these images and we describe them as best we can being astronomers, it would make the web not so stupid a place. And so we wanted there to be a smart web and not a stupid web. And that was one of the ideas for behind APOD, why we started doing this, to make the, the web a smarter place. Another reason is because, um, so when I was a graduate student, we would teach classes different times, and uh, 
many times, though, the professors at University of Pennsylvania would teach the day classes, but the night classes would be taught sometimes by the graduate students, and so there would be a competition. And what we'd, we'd want to show images. So you want to show an image of Saturn. You want to show an image of something, right? So the University of Pennsylvania had this, this slide collection, these Kodak, these spheric circular things, and you would put the little slides in there, and then you would show them through the slide projector, and then one of them would always get stuck, and so you'd have to, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, you're trying to get in there, like, I think, I think I can get it out, you know, and uh, show in pictures. So uh, what happened was the University of Pennsylvania spent money on their astronomy slide collection. They would buy the latest slides from different places. But one of the graduate students decided that they weren't doing good enough, they were going to have their own slide collection. And then it occurred to many of the graduate students who were doing nighttime lectures that, hey, we, I went into the slide room and I couldn't find a good picture from Voyager of, at Saturn. But I know, you know, my friend Jeff, graduate student, has those. So we would start having to ask Jeff for some of the cool slides. And way back then, this was the mid-80s, it occurred to me that this wasn't a really good way, you know, because Jeff was a nice guy, but it was a bother to him, and then we were, he was doing us a favor. And so then in 1995, when we started annotating the images, it seemed to me another impetus behind Astronomy Picture of the Day is that we don't want people to have to go to Jeff and ask for the slides, right? Here they are. Here's the best slides from Voyager, the best images from here, best images from that. So we're just going to do one a day, and then, then you know, that should be more than enough to get the best slides out there. And then we'll just keep it sequential so you can go back and find the old ones. And so that's sort of the, the two of the main ideas that went into this. And it it's just become... Uh, quite popular because many people do want to see the latest images. They, you know, many teachers, they do want to show the latest slides. But not only that, they want to go back and find uh, other images. And so we're sort of a repository of cool astronomy images. So we're useful to not only the astronomical community, but we're useful to people who just have a general interest in astronomy. So we're kind of cool about that. We're, we're happy about that. And I mean, we think about it, 28 years 365 photos a year. That's a lot of pictures. What is that? 6,000 ish. Yeah. Like, so it's yes. So there's thousands of them out there. So we do yeah. what we call sometimes best of sometimes thought of as uh, reruns many times on weekends. And so the reason we do that is because we're, our audience is constantly turning over and many of the more recent people haven't seen the best images from like the 2000s. So how can we do that if we're always showing absolutely new images? So many times on weekends, we will rerun one of the best images from yesteryear and update the explanation because the understanding of the astronomical community has increased somewhat usually. And sometimes the links have gone dead, the old links. So we, we refresh the links too. So we're, we are, we do refresh. So all, so the, the count of images isn't just the number of days because there's a lot of repeat images. Um, not most, but some, but yeah, we're, we've got thousands out there. And I mean, your standards are very high. Like they are the best of the best of the best. And I'm sure, you know, everyone listening to this, watching this, has stumbled into a pod at some point, and it's just a rabbit hole. You just look at the next picture well, and then the next picture. Wouldn't it be picture. great? Wouldn't it be great if we could take a universe and whenever somebody took the coolest astronomy image, they would send it to you? Yes. Wouldn't that be a great universe? So let's say someone in another country, another part of the U.S., they took a great image. I don't know, but you know what? They send it to me. <laughs> like, That's, wow, yeah. So yeah. the universe has constructed itself so that I get to see the greatest images. I don't have to do anything. Same with uh, Jerry Benel, my co-author co on, on iPod. And it's great. So we're surfing that. We're surfing that, having a good time. Right. All you have to do is look at all of the pictures that aren't quite as great. So, like, how many pictures do you end up looking through on a, I don't know, daily basis? Like, what is your sort of, what's your process? Yeah, so it's increased over the years as well, there's a lot more people who are able to do really good astrophotography, amateurs, as well as the major observatories. So we now reject about 20 images for every one that goes up. So that's one of the sad parts, that some people send in a really good image, right? Hey, I was somewhere in the world, I took a really cool image, here it is. And we went with another one, or we put yours on hold for a little bit, but we never really found a space for it. So it's kind of sad that we can't run them. So now we have a Facebook page 
um, that also is, is mirrored on Instagram called Facebook Sky. And then we have some of the one of the one of the purposes of Facebook Sky is to take the images that we're interested in, or we found interesting in some way, or we'd like to see better vetted. That's another long story, and we put them on Facebook Sky first, and we see how the Facebook Sky audience reacts to them, and um, also it gives more images, more. So we have a focus group, and we have more images up there, so that more people can say, "Well, I might not have made it on the main APOD site, but I made it on sort of the second tier site." And so that's uh, a big thing for for people. And I'm, I'm again, I'm so sorry. There are so many good images out there. I'm so sorry that we can't use more images than we do. And we don't only choose the coolest, coolest images. We do you know, the really coolest ones. But sometimes there's a really educational image out there, and it just demonstrates something like, "Oh, that's how that works." Like that's some eclipse thing. That's how that works. Now I understand. Yeah, the eclipse is a shadow. And here you can see the shadow on the earth, right? So we'll run some of those because they're just so interesting and so educationally oriented in that in a useful way. And so we, we would then try to describe them. Other times I just see an image and it's not super spectacular, but I immediately see a story in there. This must happen to you. You hear or see something and you say, you know what? I can see a story in that. And so... I look at the image and I think about it and I do a little background research and I might say, yeah, that's, there's a cool story that can be written in our little caption there that teaches something that presents this image. So another thing is if it just happens to hit us right, we, we might put that up there too. So there's a little bit of a random chance there too. But it's yeah. been a hoot for 28 years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like for me, I'm always, I'm sort of running this model of, our current understanding of astronomy across all of the different fields. And when there's a really interesting incremental improvement, an explanation for something that had been puzzling and troubling us, then for me, that's a story. And we'll write an article on it, even though maybe a press release hasn't been sent out or whatever, but that that it is this really interesting chance to educate and keep people up to date. Because I, I don't know, I feel like, like everyone knows about the stuff that was understood in the 70s. And yet there are all these new amazing discoveries happening all the time all around us. And yet for some reason, like, I don't know, maybe the news media isn't so good at explaining it anymore. But people are sort of like, what's the great attractor? Right? Like, oh, it's been solved. We know what it is. So, well, you and your your you and universe today and all things are really good at this. So you're really a pro at this. You really know your stuff. You've been doing this for as long as I have. Maybe. Twenty five years. And, yeah, uh, not quite. Yeah, twenty five years. So so I know that when I see something that you're involved with, that it's it's really high quality. Whereas if I see somebody even at a major news outlet that I don't know, maybe it's high quality, maybe it's not so high quality. Sometimes they just go with the the media push, but you know better generally. And so yeah. having been around for 28 years, there are some times that, that, that I know a little better too, but I'd say you're doing great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So I want to shift gears now and talk about your new book because you sent me a copy and I've never read a book like this before because it is like structured like a quiz of questions that people might ask each other when they're in the bar. And they happen to have a physicist handy to start throwing some of their, their questions around. And structured this way, you like you can't help but think the, think through the answer. And then you and then you see the answer, and then you think of the next one, you think of the answer. Um tell, talk about the faster than light. What was well, the yeah, answer? The, the the question and answer part of the, which is most of the, the book uh, for uh, Faster Than Light, the full title is Faster Than Light, How Your Shadow Can Do It, But You Can't. See, I remember I it so well, I had to actually look at the, the book to, to remember that. But uh, many times I've gone through changes in how I think about how fast light is and different things that, that light can do. And many times, so I have these, all, these questions that have been, I've been pondering for my professional life, even before APOD. Uh, and sometimes I have misconceptions. So what's really cool is I can try with this book, what I tried to do is I tried to coin what it is that question was, or something similar to that question. And then I would say, here's things I, I, I don't 
present it that way, but here's things I used to think. Is it like I used to think this way, A? Is it like I used to think that way, B? Or is it, and then usually C or D is like a really crazy, funny, I try to make it funny, a humorous, silly, silly is a good word, silly answer. And because I, when I teach and the people at my house have to put up with my, my continued silliness. So this is, uh, this is a way to exercise uh, my silliness. Um, and then, you know, then people can think about all these things. And uh, if they were as, conf you know, interested in the topic as I was, this is a fundamental question. And if they had misconceptions like I did, you know, and so I, I'm paid to teach this stuff. And I sometimes I'm just so confused by this. So I'm, I'm able to, to coin exactly what it was. And then I would go through the answers and say, without math, there's like very little math in the book. It's all about concepts. Right. I would say, here's why that concept doesn't really work. And I don't say, but I used to think it did. But so I make myself look you know, smarter and better than I am. But here's what really happens and here's why it happens as best I can explain it to someone who's just an interested nonfiction reader. And, uh, and it's just been cathartic to, to, to write the book because I've been thinking about and wondering about these things for so long. And so I read it through it now and I say, yeah, I, I, I remember you know, thinking about that. And sometimes I even have even more thoughts having to do with this. And so maybe there'll be like a second edition at some point because uh, science, as you know, isn't just an end point where you just tell what the answer is. Science is a frontier. And in individual scientists too, they're always changing a little bit sometimes what they think about different things. And so based on writing this and talking with people, my answers to some of the questions might be a little bit more nuanced in some ways. Uh, but uh, for the most part, though, I don't know of any major, major changes yet in the book. Uh, right. So, and it was just so much fun to write. Well, so this, I, I mean, the concept, the book is called Faster Than Light. Yes. And, and the gist is that nothing can move faster than, than the speed of light, except all the ways that things can move faster than the speed of light. Right. And so when I, when I was growing up, when I was when I was an undergraduate, when I was in high school, I would love to repeat the phrase, "Oh, nothing can go faster than light." It was like I had power. Yeah. And only I guess when I first realized it when I was an undergraduate, but uh, while well, it's not the first of many people, I, I realized what other people were saying is that there are things, not massive things. You and I, we can't go. I can't. I don't know. Maybe you have special powers now, but I can't go faster than light. However, I found out that along the way, my shadow can. And I didn't know that. And not only that, but I can take a laser pointer and I can point a laser at a wall or at something like that. And that laser pointer, it can go faster than light. And so how is that? You know, I thought nothing can go faster than light. And then over my, over the past 10 years or so, when you can cut paper with scissors and the the scissors blade isn't going to move faster than light, but the, the cut part can move across the paper faster than light. It doesn't violate special relativity at all. It doesn't have mass. Its energy doesn't go off the scale. It's just, you just have to think about ways of, that it happens and, and it can happen. And there's even a very simple example. So let's say you go into a dark room uh, and you turn on a single light bulb somewhere. You know, poof, light bulb goes on. So it's a standard room. It's got walls. Uh, originally, the walls are dark. Okay, not a big surprise. After certainly a second or two, after you turn on the light bulb, the um, walls are illuminated, so they're not dark anymore. So somewhere between when it was dark and when it was light, there was uh, places on the wall where the, the light would hit the wall and then the, the brightness would then move out from where it first hit the wall and you would have a dividing line between where it used to be dark and where it's going to be light and that would move out, right? So I call that an illumination front, but I'm not the only one. So it turns out, and I didn't know this until a few years ago, that illumination fronts always move faster than light. And so the question is, well, how come I can't see that? I, I've turned on lights all the time. Uh, one of the major reasons is because our brain-eye connection really only updates at about a tenth of a second. And the speed of light on walls, uh, the not speed of light, the illumination fronts on walls uh, move so fast, uh, faster than light, in fact. But you'd have to be able, for standard distances to walls, you'd have to be able to see on the nanosecond time scale which we can't. But nowadays, there's a fast camera equipment uh, that can. So you can actually take a video now of an illumination front spreading out faster than light. And 
So, I mean, like a lot of them are these sort of interesting, as you say, you know, a shadow can move faster than light. You can point a laser print pointer. You give the example of looking at the sun and then, you know, maybe let's not use the sun. Let's use the moon because you should look at the sun with your eyes. But anyway, you look at the moon and then you turn your head 90 degrees and now, you know, in your field of view, the moon has shifted an enormous amount of distance and has moved there faster than the speed of light. I guess maybe the moon maybe can move faster than your eyeball, than the speed of light in the distance that it is. But but the point being that, you know, you could turn 180 degrees and bring the moon back to the same spot faster than it's going to take that light to move back. And so from your perspective, the moon is moving at faster than the speed of light. But there's- Yeah, so you, you can say that of pretty much everything out there. Uh, actually, the moon is one of the few exceptions. So right. you don't even have to move. The sun, if you're near the equator, the sun rises and sets. Uh, and you just watch it go. And you attribute the distance to the sun. How fast would it have to go from one side to the other? You'd have, the sun is moving faster than light. But that doesn't really mean. It's really what's only happening is the Earth is turning. But still, if you attribute it moving from this side to that side at the distance of the sun... There's no way that could happen. So that's that's one of the, the tricks. So that's one of the – there's a big descri- big division in the book made between things that happen in objective reality and things that happen to a ob- subjective observer. So the sun appearing to rise and set uh, faster than light uh, is it's an observer effect. It's However, uh, when the sun rises and then your shadow appears – uh, your shadow on the ground, if you could have cameras along the ground, you could see that your shadow actually starts moving faster than light wow. in objective reality. And so, but, but the kinds of like cosmological ideas that I think about, one being that when we look out to the, you know, billions of light years away from us, we are seeing galaxies that are moving faster than the speed of light, and yet we can see them. So how is that possible? Okay, so in the book, yeah, so I, I, I divide it up into different sections. So one is the cool stuff involving scissors and uh, flashing lights that sometimes can appear to flash. But another section is quantum mechanics, why it seems that you can have things like entanglement where information seems right. to go Right, we'll get to that in light. a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then but another section is just cosmology. How is it that these distant galaxies are supposed to be moving faster than light? So the simple answer to that is that the, the in special relativity, the faster than light effect is a special relativity relativistic effect right near you. It's actually also a general relativistic effect right near you called local. So nothing can pass you, zooming by you, at a speed that you will clock as faster than light. It just can't happen. Uh, Not even in general relativity. However, if something is away from you, then its speed is not constrained like that, particularly in general relativity. So the distant galaxies can move increasingly fast as they go further and further away. And eventually, at some point, they're moving out so fast. And what's cool about that is that that is, you will not lose sight of that galaxy. That galaxy will always, like, you don't lose sight of the microwave background. There's not, we don't put on our calendars the day the microwave background is going to disappear, right? So that's not going to happen. And so every galaxy you see out there, there, you don't put on your calendar, well, this is the year that that galaxy is going to go faster than light and go away. But even so, that, that gal- what you see is you're always going to see an image of that galaxy, but gal- ga- that galaxy image is eventually going to freeze and go become redder and redder and redder, re- greater cosmological redshift and dimmer and dimmer. And so it'll fade away and freeze. Uh, but if you were to take a laser pointer and ask another question, so you can take a laser pointer and point it out into the universe and say, will the laser light from this laser pointer, will it reach out to these galaxies that I see? And for the close-by galaxies right now, the answer is yeah. So if you point your laser light toward the Andromeda galaxy, yeah, you're going to see it's going to get there. It's going to be so dim that they're not, you know, they'll be too busy doing other things but uh, to care about my laser pointer, but they, you, they would see it. But it turns out that, and I didn't do the science for this, but, uh, but I, I read the papers and it's really cool. The redshift is at about redshift three, cosmological redshift three. So we can see galaxies now out past redshift of three, particularly with the GEMS Web Space Telescope and stuff like that. But if you shine your laser light, if it's redshift three now, we'll always see it. But the laser light you shine will never get there. Because in objective reality, these things are moving out faster than light and your laser light's just not going to catch it. It's a little bit like the black hole analogy where something falls into a black hole and you still see the image hovering outside the black hole. 
but it's long gone. You can't go get it. It's a little bit like that with galaxies. So if you were to shine your laser pointer at a black hole, trying to illuminate something, fall into a black hole, not going to happen. But uh, but uh, same thing with, uh, it's similar out in, in cosmology. So yeah, they were losing the ability to communicate far out into the universe. And eventually we'll lose the ability to communicate even with the Andromeda galaxy, but that's not for a long time in the future. And so that, that redshift three, that's the cutoff? Like if it's redshift it's one? It's not exactly three. It just yeah. so happens to be in our concordance universe. It happens to work out to about redshift three. I don't remember the exact number. Yeah, I, I, like I know that like it starts to get weird because for galaxies that are closer to us, then the laws of physics sort of behave a little more normally. But once you're starting to move to these larger distances, then you're having to deal with kind of cosmological redshift and different math needs to be cracked out to be able to to make those calculations because like close in if you're measuring the redshift it's literally just a multiplier of the speed of light like if it's yes. you know yes. if, it's, if it's redshift is 0.1 then that yes. galaxy is moving 0.1c but if it's mm -hmm. redshift 10 it's not 10 times the speed of light that it's moving away from you it's things get weird right. yep. there's a certain crossover yeah, the distant universe is a strange place, even visually. So when you move something away, it gets nearby you, it gets angularly smaller and smaller and smaller. Like my hand, if you can't see this on the podcast, but I'll hold it near the microphone so you can stare at your microphone and see it. Uh, but at, at some point in the universe, uh, the my hand reaches its angular minimum. And then as I move it further away, it becomes angularly larger, dimmer, but larger. Uh, and so that's uh, called angular diameter distance, the distance that that calibrates that. And so there's these different, the actually describing what distance is on cosmological scales becomes strange. You have luminosity distance, you have uh, proper distance, you have angular diameter distance, and these all describe some of the weird ways things, things appear differently as you go far out in the universe. But it's all described essentially by a smoothed out version of uh, general relativity and what's called Friedman, Roberts, and Walker cosmology. So it's not People have been working with the equations of Friedman, Roberts, and Walker cosmology for, you know, I don't know, 100 years maybe. And uh, so the solutions are well known. But now that we can see that the universe is expanding, acceleration, acceleration is accelerating, and we know which version of Friedman, Roberts, and Walker cosmology we're in, we can more calculate more exactly how it is, where it is this, this faster than redshift, faster than light line is in the universe that's moving out. Whereas before it was more of a, it was more of a conceptual thing that probably happens. We don't know where. Yeah. And so it's, it's crazy to think there's this part of the universe that we can reach and we can affect, we could get to. And if we sent our, our spacecraft out to, we could, we could reach them and, and visit the aliens there. And then there's a certain point where they're on a boat and they're, <laughs> we have, all we can do is wave and they can't even see us waving. Right. That's they're correct. gone. They cannot see you waving. You yeah. can see them, but you can't see them waving forever. They're moving really slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yep. it's crazy. All right, so that, I think that's one place where people are, are kind of familiar that things can move fast in the speed of light. And then the other one that comes up more regularly is this idea that, you know, when light moves through a medium, the speed changes. And so, like, you yes. could have light moving through rubidium and you could outrun it. Yeah. How? Well, there's the book gets has little chapters on on things where it defines things, not defines, but recaps things like what the group velocity of light is, what the phase velocity of light is, or something called a front velocity of light. But in sum, when light goes into things like water or rubidium, it just moves slower. The wave and phase velocity both are pretty pretty similar. Uh, they both uh, they both move much slower than it does light does through vacuum. So if you have a particle, uh, or if you're if you're up to, to speed, if you can go that fast, um, you can um, let's say a, a muon can go through water a long way without being absorbed. So if you have a race and you have photons go through water, and then you have a muon that goes through vacuum at the speed of light in vacuum, and then goes in water, and then you set them off at the same time, you would find out that the muon would reach the end of the pool in the race faster than the photon which is really strange. But also it would do weird things like create a different kind of radiation than we normally see called Trankoff radiation. And if you looked at it from a certain angle, one of my researches is there's, there's a weird effect that occurs there uh, that um, when things move faster than the speed of light in that medium, you get uh, a strange 
optical phenomena called relativistic image doubling. So instead of just seeing the muon come toward you at fast enough speed of light, when the muon is moving faster than light toward you, you don't see that light, you'd see the muon first. But then in perspective, as it slows down toward you, if it, even if it's going faster than light, the speed toward you, when that drops to below the speed of light, then you suddenly start seeing the light can get to you. So at that point, you suddenly see two images uh, separate. And it's the phenomena of relativistic image doubling is not well known out there because people just generally picture this straight linear case. And so one of the things of my current research is, is to try to find relativistic image doubling out in the universe. And that's not because objects really move. Well, there is things like trend cover radiation, but you can even get this with shadows out in the universe and uh, illumination fronts out in the universe. So when you have a, a star flash and the star flashes around uh, and there's a ring there. So the star will illuminate the ring all at the same time. However, if you see the ring edge on, then you're going to see the near part of the ring illuminated faster than the far, the far part of the ring. But then the speed that you see the illumination go from the near part of the ring to the far part of the ring, that's faster than light. And so who cares? It goes faster than light. But that actually tells you something. If you can measure that speed, and if you can see relativistic image doubling events and where they occur on that ring, it can tell you things about the geometry of the ring and the distance between the flash and the ring, distance scales on the ring that we didn't know before. So part of my research is trying to find those things and calibrate them. But generally, people don't know to look for them. Frequently, we're going into, with the Rubin Space Telescope and other things, we're going into the realm of high dynamic range astronomy, where people take lots of images of things over time. So you were building up the, the time sequence of how things change. So my hope is that we would then take enough high resolu time resolution images of things that would have rings that we might be able to see this effect, and then we would essentially open up a different way of seeing um, the, the faster than light universe or the universe in general. I mean, there are some of these like tangentially related to that, right? You have light echoes where where you can see the the flash of some bright object, or maybe you missed it because it happened a couple hundred years ago, but you still see the, the echo of it moving through. And so is that kind of yes. similar? Like as your echo is moving through some surrounding nebular gas, you're getting it illuminating and you're getting that faster than light. Yes. So the, the right. things like the Hubble Variable Nebula, Heinz Variable Nebula, they all have essentially shadows on them that are moving faster than light. But the problem is that we, we don't have high time resolution photography of that. So we can't really see the illumination fronts move very well. I am hopeful that in the future we'll do better and better with that and be able to actually see them move. The other problem with things like the uh, Hubble Variable Nebula is it's not a smooth surface and we don't know what the surface is. It could be all bendy, curvy, bumpy, things like that like that. And then things just get tremendously complicated. But there are many, some things in astronomy and astrophysics that are relatively well behaved. There are rings, dust rings, um, things in galaxies that are relatively circular, things like that. So um, we are hopeful that, that we will get a, a behavior, a, a surface well enough behaved that we can understand what's going on and we can get high enough dynamic range uh, imagery so we can keep looking at it again and again and again and follow these illumination fronts and see what they're doing and track them if they do move faster than light, which they well, should. There was a paper that came out, I think just yesterday about, or two days ago about Kilanova. Like we know that Kilanova detonate in a perfect sphere. I mean, this appears to be the 2017 Kilanova was a perfect sphere. And by getting a perfect sphere, you've got this almost like perfect object to make distance calculations with because it's not going to be lumpy bumpy it's going to be this equally illuminated gadget and as long as you know how bright it is intrinsically then you can use that as a very accurate method of, of measuring distance in the universe and i guess i'd never thought about it but if you're getting this illumination in a perfect sphere then you're going to get some really nice echoes if if it's going to pass through some kind of nearby medium so maybe you know kilanova are the are the way to go yeah, I, actually, I haven't seen that paper, so you're, you're ahead of me. Uh, maybe if it's a really good image involved, we might, might run that on APOD. But, but, so that, that could be a really good place. But it, it turns out that exactly how spherical and how close to the center of the sphere is your illuminating thing. So if you have something that's right in the center of a sphere, exactly in the center, it's going to illuminate the entire sphere at the same time. But you just move it a tiny little bit off from the center. 
and then the right side, one side, will be illuminated before the other side, and, but since it's only very slightly off the center, the illumination front is going to zip from one side to the other in, in a small, you know, maybe a small fraction of a second, but on astronomical timescales it could be seconds, minutes, days. But even slight deviations from being in the center could have dramatic effects in the way illumination fronts move. And so, I mean, you could, you, I mean, we talk about, you know, what's the speed of a shadow and, you know, <laughs> when we giggle about it, but definitely there are situations where something is, ca you know, casting a very bright illumination and it is casting a shadow. I mean, I can think about some of these planetary, star forming nebulae, planetary nebulae, things like that, where maybe you can't observe the light itself or you can't observe the speed of light, but you can watch as the shadows are shifting across some kind of surface. And that tells you something about what is, what is doing the illuminating, right? Yes. As back to the Hubble's variable nebula, it is thought there are knots of gas moving near some bright source, some bright source stars. And the, the reason why it's variable is because you're seeing those shadows move. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's blocking the light from it. But as again, the, we can't, Oh, I just, just the other day, someone submitted to APOD an image of, of the highest time resolution I've ever seen for the Hubble's Variable Nebula. And I was looking at it frame by frame, and I just couldn't see anything I really understood. But we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer. So, so, so maybe one day. Yeah. Um, I know one of the, like, we got the, that first image of the M87 Event Horizon Telescope image back in 2019, but it wasn't until last year that we finally got Sag A-Star. And the reason was because, you know, the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way is moving so quickly that, like, the changes are happening in this dynamic level. It's really hard to kind of pull out the noise. And so, again, sometimes, like, seeing these things farther away and seeing them bigger and watching them more slowly is a real advantage than when they're right next close to you and, and you're not able to untangle all of the motion that's going on. Yes. So on the wall, due to your room lights, they might be interfering and they might have interference patterns moving around the room, your room at the nanosecond time scale. And your, your brain just can't go that fast. But if you take that and scale it up by many factors and put it out in the universe, then the time scales go up and we're better able to see it. So yeah, all these, many of these effects happen in the room. They're just so fast. We can't see them. Now, what about gravitational lensing? How does like gravity, you know, I think about things like us seeing a supernova go off four times thanks to a mm -hmm. gravitational lens. What, I mean, are things there moving faster than the speed of light at any point? Okay. Well, I did my thesis, my PhD thesis on gravitational lensing. So, um, First of all, none of the, the moving blobs in gravitational lensing, if it has mass in general, it's not moving relative to other things right near it faster than light. You have to have cosmology for that to happen. So, however, if you were to attribute a distance, the distance to the lens, to the images, and then you see the images move around, then yeah, those images, if it contributed to that distance, would then be moving faster than light. Yeah, so you can, you can work that in there. But in that case, it doesn't really doesn't really give you any information that you didn't know because you, you're trying to solve the unknowns are in exactly what the, the mass distribution of the lens is and exactly what the variable distribution of the light is, I guess. But for a supernova, it's just essentially a flash. So they're trying to figure out, people are trying to figure out exactly what it is, the distribution of light in the, in the galaxies and in the cluster galaxies that's giving these supernovas that go off in a galaxy to come off in this certain in the in the in the way we see it, and that tells us a lot about things about uh, the mass distribution in the cluster of galaxies. And there's even a term in there that has Hubble's constant in there, which, as you know, with Hubble tension is a big thing. But I don't think they're they're accurately measuring the Hubble constant in that way to be competitive with with the other projects just now. But if we could see that distant galaxy directly and and watch the aliens waving goodbye, and then we were watching it. In through the gravitational lens, would we see the their wave speed be different because it's you know it's being magnified and or are we still going to see the same redshift? It's just with more resolution. If we could angularly resolve it, maybe. But generally, we with things like supernova, we just see a spot, so we don't see the spot. So you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> I'm trying to think in real time. So I, we don't, with supernova, we don't see the spot move much at all. 
So, uh, the, what's so the this wasn't one of the this, it, this wasn't one of the questions in your book. So I'm you know I'm definitely right. mm-hmm. you know going beyond. Mm-hmm. And maybe like, it's like, like other scientists, but particularly me, many times when somebody asks me a question, I think, ooh, that's a good one I have to think about. And people sometimes are surprised because they think that in this certain sub, sub, sub range, I've thought about everything already. Sometimes they hit something that I've thought about already as some of these questions, but sometimes not. And so I end up trying to think, well, how, how would that work then? And uh, of course, every Monday morning quarterback, you know, uh, tomorrow morning, I'll send you an email saying, here's an exact answer to that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, we talked about sort of two of the big ones that people think about. The third one is entanglement, this, you know, spooky action at a distance. And that it feels really like something is moving faster than the speed of light and not just some perceptual trick, but something weird is going on. Uh, how, how does that work? So when writing the entire, I'm not, I don't do research in entanglement. So I do sort of research into some of the other areas in the book. So it's, it was easier for me to write those for when the entanglement chapters, I was a, uh, a science uh, reporter. And uh, so I read a lot. And actually those sections were read over, had the most number of science reviewers. Some of those sections had five different science reviewers in them. And they would say, oh no, you got this one wrong. It's like, ooh, okay. I'm sorry, what's the right answer? And then we wouldn't really debate it because they would know better than me. But so uh, one of those is entanglement. So I learned a lot about entanglement in writing this book. And so here's my my quick and dirty answer as to how in, entanglement and um, works and seems to communicate faster than light. So let's say that there's um, a particle, antiparticle created in in out in space, and someone in the Andromeda galaxy measures a spin of this one entangled particle, and we here in the Milky Way measure the spin of the other entangled particle. And so the question is, if they were, if you both measure these things in the same direction, then when I measure my particle, let's say you're on the Andromeda galaxy, you, I would know that you would measure the exact opposite spin. Right, so it wouldn't really be communication because we're measuring the, along the same angle. It's just that's the way that's the way conservation of angular momentum works. Yeah, I'm up, you're down. That's fine. Now, if we measure on right angles to each other, then what I measure, I don't know what the the. It's going to be just a random up, down, up, down, and so you know. So so let's go back to the completely in. We measure them in the same direction. I measure random up, down, up, down, and you measure random up, down, up, down. But we know that since it was, we're measuring on the same, same line, that we're always measuring the opposite of each other. So it's not communication, anything like that. It's just, communi- it's just conservation of magnetic momentum. But if we do it at right angles, then I'm measuring up, down, up, down, random, up, up, down, down, up, down, and you're measuring up, up, down, down, random. Uh, but they're un- completely uncorrelated. It's like, oh no, I, you, you, you can't tell what I measured. I can't tell what you measured because they're completely at right angles. It gets really interesting when you get in the middle. When you get in the middle, it turns out that what I'm doing is correlated. What, if I measure it at 45 degrees relative to you, um, uh, then what I measure and what you measure seem to be oddly correlated in ways that you wouldn't expect. So it seems like when I measure something, it seems like I'm sending you some kind of information so that when you measure yours at 24 to 5 degree angle, that you're affected and you're not just measuring it, you know. But what happens is I'm still measuring completely random, up, down, 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 up, down, and you're measuring completely random, up, down, down, up, down. So I can't tell you anything. You're just going to keep measuring random. I'm going to keep measuring random. And only later when I say, here's the answer key. I was measuring at 45 degrees and here's when I was measuring up and here's when I'm measuring down, then you look at that answering key and say, oh, you know what? There is a correlation. And the weird thing is that, that correlation even works if you measured it before I measured it. So that correlation stands up. So it seems like not only with quantum mechanics do you measure um, what seems to be faster than light, but if you believe that I had what's called um, free will, that I was affecting what you would measure even before it, it was measured. So it seems like it's what's called retrocausality. But you can't use that to communicate back in time. Or I can't tell you anything because you're always measuring random and I'm always measuring random. Only later, at the speed of light, when the answer key is sent from one of us to the other, finally answer, they, can we compare and say, oh, they were correlated in, in strange ways. So that's why people think, seem to think that 
that why it's commonly said that quantum mechanics allows faster than light communication because these correlations you wouldn't normally see. But then again, it's not a way to send information. We've never found any way to send information faster than light. Right. That that you know, if I measure up, you measure down. And if we mm-hmm. line them all up, every time I measured up, you measured down. Every time I de- measured down, you measured up. They all line up perfectly. And I can mm-hmm. make my measurement, and then you can make your measurement a year later, and we'll still get that same sort of similarity. Um, yes. But there's nothing that happens to my particle that goes, you know, that an alarm goes off and says, oh, Robert just measured his version of the particle uh, you should check yours. I mean, that's the problem right. is that we don't know who did what, when. And so, that's right. and yeah. so, but, but, and, and like, that's all fine. Like, it's not fine. It's not great. It's weird. It's not great. Um, it's weird. It's, it's weird. Really weird. But the part that's so weird to me is that before the measurement happens, as long as you don't measure, then you can have them act like waves and they can do things like they can interfere with themselves. And like, you can do all of the stuff that you can do with waves. It's that yes. when you, finally make the measurement then it locks in a place and that's kind of yes. back to that idea that it, and thus it ever was right that the way you explain mm-hmm. this is that that the outcome of that particle was decided at the beginning of the universe well there's there's two competing sort of theories and i try to give them both play in the book one is predestination the reason why that you can have that correlation is because we are just billiard balls on the pool table of life bouncing around Right. So th- th- at the big break, it was decided what would happen. And we're just living out. We're just playing our part. Right. And then when you measured up and measured down, you weren't you didn't have free will to determine that. You just had to do that because that's you were a billiard ball. And that was the next bumper you were supposed to bounce on to off of. Whereas another way is if you did have free will or I had free will and we said, well, I might measure it the other way now. Then there's it's really that's called. um the first one was predestination, and the second one is called retrocausality. And so retrocausality says that that can cause you to measure yours in a, in a, in a way that seems to go back in time, but doesn't, communication, doesn't communicate any information back in time. So those two interpretations sort of compete. Uh, but the really odd thing is that even though you can interpret them both, both ways, it doesn't change the way quantum mechanics works and the way things through quantum predictions, through the Schrodinger equation and things like that, it still works the same. These are just interpretations of what's going on. We don't have a way of testing between the two right now. So I guess one other place where I think people are familiar with this idea of things moving faster than the speed of light was the concept of inflation back at the beginning of the universe, that Mm. the universe started, the observable universe started what might have been a singularity and then within a fraction of a second was the size of a grapefruit or volleyball or something like that. And that it was growing exponentially quickly where regions were moving away from each other at faster than the speed of light. And that's, you know, that solves a bunch of problems for the Big Bang. How does that sort of figure into this in your brain? Uh, Okay. So, uh, not that's a really good question. So the more distant galaxies, first of all, you don't need inflation to have all you need is an infinite universe to have the furthest galaxies being moving away from you faster than light. Inflation is just an, an epic that that made it even more apparent that that things like that were, were, were happening. So um, let's see. So yeah, so things that are things that used to be in contact are now out of contact. And so uh, there was a big part of that that happened in inflation, but that's still happening now. And we're slowly moving into a region where our universe is uh, increasing in its expansion rate that's starting to look a little bit like a second inflationary epoch where things are moving out faster and faster. So the things, we're losing contact with things that are closer and closer, which means that things that are closer are actually moving away from us faster, just like they did back in the inflationary Epic. So yeah, back then, things that are away from you, nothing can pass you going faster than light, but things that are far away from you, according to general relativity, not special relativity, then they, they can be moving away from you faster than light. So I don't know if I exactly answered your question. No, but, I, uh, I, guess, I guess the point is that it, it's the same as the first question, right? And, and that, but, but that idea of, of inflation, or of, of, I guess, the accelerating expansion of dark energy being a second inflation is a really interesting concept. I'd never sort of thought of it that way, but I, but I think that's a really uh, interesting way to, to, to think about it. That, I didn't think of it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, but, mm-hmm. but that 
that back at the beginning of the early universe, because things, you know, inflation explains why parts on the left side of the universe and parts on the right side of the universe didn't communicate. And, and that into the future, if you ask people 30 years ago, places that they thought would communicate now won't communicate. And maybe that's going to be a challenge for future cosmologists where they're like, you'd think these places would have had a chance to communicate, but they didn't. That's weird. Um, so was there, was there anything like those are the sort of the top ones that I like and the ones that sort of make my head scratch. What are some other examples of things that are, you know, moving faster than the speed of light that that you really like and are sort of your, some of your favorite parts of the book? Well, one thing is just one of the questions in the book is that uh, the question is, it doesn't matter that things can appear to move faster than the light. Like, who cares? Like, it's a, is it a, should you go to a carnival sideshow and say, oh, look, look at the spot moving faster than the light? Who cares? But what happens is when the illumination front moves across the walls faster than light, if you could catch that on a video, it's very similar to LIDAR. And you, cannot, you can map out the room by seeing how fast illumination fronts go. And so many people have iPhones that now essentially do LiDAR. Now, they don't do it exactly like that. They don't trace the illumination fronts. They bounce, they bounce uh, photons and they time how long it takes for them to come back. But still, it, its cousin is the illumination fronts moving. So if we could better understand on the time scale of nanoseconds in the room and we can see these illumination fronts move, maybe even with the cam the smartphones that we have, instead of getting a static 2D picture, when you just look at a picture, you don't really know the depth. I mean, your brain knows that, well, the ocean's in the background, right? The ocean's not in the foreground. So your brain fills in a lot of these things, but it doesn't know that from looking at the flat picture. But if you were able to monitor the illumination fronts move, then you can see, wow, the illumination front moved angularly really fast there and angularly slow there. And, and you can then put that into the little processor and it can then give you a three-dimensional version of what it is you're seeing. So using illumination fronts, we're actually able to, it's actually useful in some way, and it's opening up the 3D world to us in, in, in other ways. So it's taking flat photographs and moving them into the third dimension slowly. Huh. That's really interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming this is the exact sort of thought you had. You're like reading this going, wait a minute. There's some really interesting outcomes that this, this could bring us in terms of technology, in terms of, of science and physics and thinking about, about how we receive information about the world around us. Yeah, there are some novelties to superluminal, apparent superluminosion that are more than just novelties that might turn out to be really useful. It's a little bit like what somebody once said, a famous mathematician von Neumann says, you buy a top hat because it looks cool. And then you find out you're next to a fire. So you fill it with water and you put the fire out. It turned out to be useful. So it's, it, maybe it's a little bit like that. Um, so there could be some really cool uses for it. But I, I enjoy the concepts of it, thinking about things that we don't, we, we, we humans only live in this one little world. Then the things that are much smaller than us have on different rules that are more commonly determined by quantum mechanics. And things that are much larger than us have different rules more commonly determined by general relativity. And we're just used to this one little human scale stuff. So this superluminal stuff is actually a different scale than humans are used to are used to you dealing with and that thinking on that is actually kind of cool and kind of manic mind expanding and it takes concepts that we're familiar with and kind of pushes them in unusual directions and you start thinking about it and you say oh you know what yeah that that's kind of cool at least i did and that's one of the reasons why it was so much fun to think some of these things through and it's also a lot of fun to see all the great images that that are sent in that uh so far those two worlds haven't collided so we haven't had any superluminal fronts uh, yet uh, posted to the astronomy picture of the day. But uh, one of these days, I think those two worlds will collide. If, if someone sends you a superluminal front, you are all over it. It's going on April. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be able to write that uh, pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you've got a soft spot in your heart for creative ideas that would- As do you. As do I, yes. I mean, I think that's a thing that we are both fans of is- is when somebody comes up with a really clever way to overcome a long-standing problem in science, to think about a, a, an idea in a way that's a little more creative and, and perhaps would get them a little bit laughed at by other scientists. What, you know, 
how do you think sort of people should approach that? Because there are a few scientists out there who are, who are not afraid to write their their out their ideas, but also put some math into it and then and then make it a make it a paper. Um, how can we yeah, see more so of this? Put some- I put some thought into that. So when I was a a postdoc, my postdoc advisor at the time, actually it's Vipran, who's the one who said this actually, uh, I was telling him some of my crazy ideas and he would say, you should never publish any of that until you have tenure. (laughs) Don't even talk to people about that. So uh, I advised my university, don't give me tenure because things could come off the rails, right? So once I had tenure, I was lucky enough. Uh, So Some people, though, they're good. They have successful media empires like you. They're successful book writers and uh, media channels. And so they don't really need the protection of tenure. So when you should not do this is if you're an assistant professor, if you're on a paid contract position, then you pretty much have to toe the line. Because if you start trying to do some of these speculative ideas, it's not going to play well and you're going to be shown the door. So you have to have a steady source of income. So once that happens, though, I was so happy to get tenure because then I knew, you know, I don't know if you guys know what you're doing. Uh, (laughs) Let me tell you about time travelers. But I was able to. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done that, too. So that's another long story. (laughs) So it's uh, it's able to exercise some of the the really crazy things. And a lot of them just fall flat like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, well. But sometimes you hit on something that does kind of work. And uh, those are the ones that are are really cool. But you have to be really careful. So, yeah, if you're a young scientist out there, you want to record your ideas, you want to think about your ideas, but don't try to present ideas and expect to be taken seriously until you have some kind of job security. Because otherwise, it's going to hurt. But Sorry, that's just the way academia is built these days. But do you you think that that academia just doesn't have a sense of humor about this kind of thing or isn't willing to... Like, if you're going to say who's going to win in a fight, Superman or the Hulk, right? That is a scientific question. You know, if you ask yourself who's going to win in a fight, a great white shark or a bear, right? You're, there's an answer to that question. It depends on where they're fighting, depends on, you know, all of that kind of stuff, right? And so it is a scientific question. It's not a terribly useful scientific question, but then how useful is some of the cosmological questions that we have or some of the, you know, and so I think. It's sitting down and actually putting together the math and thinking it through, and especially if you're not throwing a lot of time at it. And there are some some papers that I really enjoy, um, things like the weight calculation. I don't know if you've seen this paper. No, I don't think I know. Well, the gist is like, let's imagine you're going to send a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri, and then you wait ten years, and then you the technology gets better, and now you send another spacecraft, and this spacecraft overtakes the first spacecraft, and you're like, well, it was you made a mistake in sending the first group. So the question is, when is the time that you would send a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri when it's not going to be overtaken? Because that is the best time to send your spacecraft. And it turns out, you know, the answer is like 700. You can't predict the future. You can't know the answer to that. Well, but you can know like the amount of energy used. You know the amount of energy that's required to to send a spacecraft. You can put in a bunch of assumptions and, and, and you can have an answer. And it might not be a correct answer, Mm -hmm. but it is an answer with, with as much of the underlying concepts that you can think through as possible. Um, uh, David Kipping from Cool World's Lab does this a lot and, you know, often makes YouTube videos that go along with it, but he'll, you know, he'll figure out things, you know, look at Bayesian calculations based on the amount of aliens that we see around us and the amount of universe that, we, that has been explored so far that you, you could start to make some predictions about stuff. So cool. how do we... How like I th- I think there's like a lot of scientists like when I talk to a lot of scientists they have this stuff bubbling up inside of them, but as you said mm-hmm. they're kind of afraid to to talk about them and oh, I think yeah. it's because they feel like people are going to get it wrong like people are, aren't going to appreciate it in the the level of depth that they're they're trying to explain it at like we're only now just able to start talking about smart aliens about about techno signatures and SETI and things like that. And that's like a deeply scientific question. Are we alone in the universe? Like there's right. an answer to that question. Absolutely. And it's a science question. So how mm-hmm. do we and yet the process illuminates other ideas. So like how do we get like get tenure? I don't, you know, is that the answer? Well, universities are businesses and businesses are somewhat conservative. So universities, they need the money. 
right? So they're going to hire people who they think can bring them the money from grants usually. And so the grants go through major granting organizations and the granting organizations, they don't want to be made fun of. They don't want to, they want to, they want to fund the next logical step. The granting organizations don't want to do something crazy. So that means that the people who work at universities are the people who are thought to be able to take the next logical step in these disciplines. That's what they're chosen for. So they're not chosen for coming up with crazy ideas. Um, for instance, uh, John Bell, he worked at the at a Collider, I think, uh, and uh, John Stuart Bell, but he was came up with Bell's, Bell's theorem. But he didn't do it because he was paid by his job. You know, he had a steady job that was taking the next logical step. But this way of, you know, measuring, um, um, you know, the, I'm missing a word, but uh, his cool effect, uh, Bell's theorem, uh, was just a paper because he was just really interested in it. And unfortunately, right now, the you know, universities or billion dollar industries, they're not just going to turn around and say, you know what, we're going to start hiring people to, who's going to do really speculative stuff. So unfortunately, the speculative stuff has to come from the relatively older people who, who already have job security or the people who can build an audience uh, in YouTube or something like that that can, can pay their bills in other way. Or sometimes they might have money from a previous generation. They might have a spouse that makes a lot of money. Um, so a lot of science advances like that. So, you know, when Newton was sitting there during the plague, uh, he had enough money from his homestead to feed him his meals. He didn't have to go off and work. And so during that time period, he was able to work on things like gravity and optics and did great stuff. So he had external support. Um, if he did, if Newton was sent out, you know, in modern day, hey, I'm going to come up with something called calculus, you know, it's going to be great. We're going to have differential equations and everything. I, nobody would fund that. They'd say, well, what do you mean? Euclid's the way to go. You know, you just, uh, you want to do slightly different geometry. Do you want to do multiple triangles now? That's what we're going to fund. Yet the big steps usually come from the, the crazy ideas. But universities are just not set up to hire people to do that at the initial stage. That's just the, the way it's, the, my understanding of the way it's organized. But, Great question, though. But, but, but at the same time, you know, when you look at sort of the people who won Nobel Prizes, I mean, no, all the Nobel Prizes are coming out this week. A lot of the times people do their Nobel work when they're young, when they're first trying to make a splash for themselves. Do you think mm -hmm. it's different now than it was... 50 years ago? Um, no, I think it's probably pretty similar. So the one I'm most familiar with is the, the, R, the RNA one. And uh, so the woman, I can't remember her name right now, she had a really hard time getting funding. And yeah. she was walking around the University of Pennsylvania. She would have loved to have a tenure track job. In my understanding, I've never spoken to the woman. My interpretation of the story that I've heard through the media is that she would have loved to have a tenure track job at the University of Pennsylvania. But because she was working on RNA um, and how that would, uh, you know, vaccines from that, eh, it's kind of crazy. No, we're not going to fund you. But looking back on it, it's like, would they hire her now? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so that in that case... And in other cases, people were working on relatively speculative stuff, and uh, maybe because they were also working in something that's less speculative, they were able to proceed in a university or in a job security route. So uh, Christian Doppler, you know, was fired for thinking about the Doppler effect way back. He said, what are you talking about? What, what, you got you to do your job, Christian. You, right. you, you can't just keep going off about this. Sounds higher pitch, sounds lower pitch. You got to stop that. You got to do your job. He was fired. Yeah. And yet we don't remember what job it was he was fired from. This is actually a little bit in the book. You know, what we remember is the Doppler effect. So he wasn't being paid for that back then. At the same time, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are like, finally, I can send my theory to Robert and he'll be able to put it to a pod. And finally, people will understand why Einstein was wrong. So, <laughs> and I know you get them too, yeah. right? You probably get a couple of them every day yeah. and I get a bunch of them yeah. every day. And so that, like, like a person needs to have done their homework, done their fundamental understanding of the science as it exists. Like they have to be able to. Yeah. And so that's the flip side of it as well is, is. I, it's so hard to tell yeah. the good ideas from the bad ideas at first. 
Um, so yeah, that's the other problem that you're a funding organization. You say, you know what? No, I'm not going to fund some crazy ideas. And you get a hundred thousand crazy ideas and you just don't know which one. Looking back on it, you can say, oh, this one, you should have funded that one. How come you didn't know about that? You know, like, uh, yeah, about this Doppler thing that the uh, things get higher pitch and lower pitch. You should have funded that. Uh, but that was along with people saying, uh, things should get, uh, you know, um, I don't know, in some different way, that things should break in half or things should turn over. And back then, they all these proposals, they all look similar. So you're right. Looking, looking back, we have many times 2020 hindsight, but uh, we didn't know that uh, RNA vaccines would be so good. We didn't know. So in a sense, you can forgive the organization. You know, they knew that if they funded something that took the next logical step, there would at least be a small step that would go forward, most likely. But so we can't really blame them because they could have funded this and it could have gone nowhere. And then the person who was going to take the next logical step that almost surely would have been successful, slightly more successful, they wouldn't have been able to take that logical step. So the funding agencies have a tough job too, figuring out what to fund. So if that's your point, that's another really good point. So it's hard to say. And I get stuff too, yeah, all the time. Here's my theory of new relativity or something. And there's all the end. So, and we post images and people say, oh no, that's not cosmology. That's my theory of how things work. And so particularly with uh, APOD captions and stuff like that, we are very mainstream. So we are not willing to endorse anything that uh, is outside the mainstream literature. And I think you probably run into that Absolutely. as well. Uh, yep. We might have our private thoughts that maybe this is a promising idea, but since we don't know, we can't really promote that. So what if there was a journal that, you know, was so, by the way, this is based on a conversation we had about 10 years right. ago. So, we're, we're going to turn back time yeah, and have okay, this conversation so go again. For it. So, what if there was a journal, right, that had a scientific basis, but would really entertain those kinds of interesting ideas? Would that be useful? That would be great because then we could have peer review. We could send mm -hmm. these ideas to somebody who, who knows some background on yeah. that. And they can say, well, no, the sun's not made of iron. Okay, we got lots of reasons right. why right. the sun's not. So we're not going to fund that. But this other idea that maybe, uh, you know, the um, reconnection events in some strange way are creating uh, unusual bursts of gamma rays. Well, yeah, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's something we should, we should look into. So the, I think the phrase we were using is a lot of science is done in the public interest. But we should have some kind of way, some kind of journal that is done because the public is interested. Yes. You know, ways of finding, let's say, here's a step that might be useful for warp drive. Wouldn't it be great to have a warp drive? Um, so, yeah, that would be. And if it's reasonably well thought out, maybe even now, a regular journal would say, oh, you're not going to have a warp drive. Come on. That's what, 100, 200 years in the future, if, that, if yeah. ever. But maybe if we had a journal that said, you know, this has ca already captured the public imagination and it is some step toward that and a reasonable step, that would be great if there was a journal like that. And we agreed to this. And then we were both, we were both so yeah. busy with so many things. Yeah. As I like to say, every day that goes by that I don't start a new project is a good day. <laughs> And so, yeah, yeah. so we just got too busy. But if there's anyone in this great listening audience who wants to help us yeah. out, I'd be happy to be on the board and to give my two cents whenever asked. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's a, a great idea that we yeah, can work yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Or at least, I mean, awesome. now that I think about it, like I look through all of the papers that are on, say, archive, and I know like that one's never going to get in a paper. Like that one's never going to go into a journal. Like that's ridiculous. But right. I love the idea. And so maybe that has yes. a home in some other place where you pick it up and you get some peer review for them and put it in, you know, and now it comes in your journal. And yeah, archive has its own cut. Not everything just makes it on archive. So maybe that would be a good thing. We could just go through or we could have someone who, who's listening to this help us go through. It's got some expertise and say, you know what? Here's a paper that appeared in archive. That's really yeah. cool. And so we could do a post journal if there's a name for this kind of journal where um, it's already appeared on archive and then we would have it refereed and we would post the referee report right. somewhere and then we would publicize it in the online journal of, you know, things that are really cool science. Yeah, really cool ideas that we that we think should get more yeah, cool publicity. Idea. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd be all for that. If there was a journal like that, I'd be flipping through that all the time. I'm unaware of one. Right. Well, then, then I think we figured out the idea. So if people listening to this yeah. would find that interesting, uh, let us know. Um, well, Robert, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. It's been if great. people want to uh, keep track of 
of your website. Uh, what's the best place to do that? Um, so the website you're talking about, I guess, is Astronomy Picture of the Day, which is currently apod.nasa.gov. But just type in Astronomy Picture of the Day or APOD into any browser and you're, we're popular enough. We do um, over a million page views a day and we're on all social media channels. So you'll find us. We're not APOD is not well hidden. So I'm very fortunate to have stumbled onto that 20, 28 years ago, and it's grown a little bit every year. So now, we, yeah, we have a tremendous audience uh, for that. So you can you can find it pretty easily. And your book yeah. again APOD. is Faster Than Light. Hold up a copy so people can see yes. again what it looks like. Okay, and, here we go. Yay. And, and it's terrific. And I think what I think it's the it's a really you know a lot of books you just read them by yourself and you go hmm and you think about it but this is a, you know each one of these little questions that you come up with you could turn to your partner and I, and they'll and they'll love it and you turn to your your partner and you say um, if you turn you know imagine well like what's the speed of a shadow and then you would give the four answers that you give in multiple choice and then they give the answer and then you have a conversation about it so it's an interactive if you can book. make if someone gets. If someone gets the book and they can make it through the book without thinking, oh, that's interesting, or if they can make it through the book without lat chuckling once, send me email, I'll send you money. The, I guess the point being that it is a great way, is it's a it's a conversation starter in a way that most science books are not. So I think if you're looking for something like that, thank you. I, I think you'll really enjoy his book. All right. Thank you so much again, thank and you. I'm sure we'll great. be talking it's soon. It's been great. I feel like you I feel like we're old friends. So good to <laughs> see right, you. Again. Good to see you too. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Robert Nimroff. I'm going to talk a bit more about some of the ideas as well as some other resources that you might like. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shiplin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonad, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verboff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. As you can tell, uh, Bob and I share this fascination with ideas, creative ideas to complicated questions and problems. And it's one area in science that I feel doesn't receive enough recognition and enough support that, you know, stay in the lane, don't stick your head out too far, uh, wait till you get tenure. And yet there's ideas that I see every day that I think are, are terrific. And so that's why we had been talking about this 10 years ago about maybe starting our own journal. So if that idea appeals to you and you think that's something that we should do, let me know. Maybe more encouragement will make me take action. I don't know. Um, but I've done a bunch of interviews with people who have very creative solutions to problems. You know, I'm not always just talking about dark matter, dark energy. Um, one is with Andrew Higgins, who is looking for ways to potentially move interstellar distances within the human lifetime and some really clever ideas to be able to do that. And then the other interview is with Dr. Sonny White, who is used to be at NASA Ames, was thinking about warp drives and other really kind of cool next generation, faster than light methods of travel. And who knows if any of it will ever happen, but it's nice to know that people are out there thinking about that. So two interviews that I think you'll really enjoy sort of continue this journey. All right. Thanks for listening.